Hey everyone, in this episode of Direct Discussions, I am honoured to sit down with the man, the myth, the legend, the pride of Ireland, the if the winning, the Oscar nominated, the one and the only, Lenny Abrahamson. I mean, where do I begin, you know? Obviously, myself, I'm Irish. Lenny is also Irish, so getting to chat with him has been an honour. You may know him for his work on stuff. I mean, he's a director behind projects such as Adam and Paul, Garage, uh, What Richard Did, Frank, Room, The Little Stranger, and he's also known for his work on recent hit TV show, uh, Conversation with Friends. He's also worked on Normal People. Uh, but that was just an intro I did off the top of my head. I didn't use a paper, any sheets or anything like that. I kind of just, I rolled these off very quickly. So Lenny, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me, sir. How are you doing today? I'm great, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here, Daniel. I'm delighted. I've, I've seen your other interviews. They're great, and I had to come on. Ah, uh, thank you. So that means the world coming from you. I mean, normally when I interview directors, I jump right into it because, you know, there's so much I want to get into. But for you, like I said, it's very different because, I mean, a lot of these directors kind of grow up in America and just kind of like, you know, you can kind of drive to L.A. and stuff like that. But you, you know, you're from here in Ireland as well. And funnily enough, I know you went to Trinity College and about two, three months ago at my school, we went on a trip to Trinity College just before we broke up for the summer and we went in. And they go, and the, the woman, she was very nice. She was talking and she was like, you may have seen us in the hit TV show, Normal People. That's been great for the school. So it's like, if they mentioned you went to Trinity College, I would have been taking pamphlets and stuff like that and stuff. But no, you did it all growing up here in Dublin, yes? Yeah, and I, it's funny because um, I was always, I always loved film and I always, like from a really young age, I would watch any moving picture. You know, I'd get up early on a Saturday morning in the days before television was 24 hours and I'd sit there with the telly on and nothing on, waiting for the kids' programs to begin. You know, so I was always kind of obsessed with 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 stories on screen. Yeah. But there wasn't really much of a film industry here at all when I was your age. You know, it was like there was a bit of stuff RTE made for, you know, soaps or whatever. And then occasionally a film would come in from abroad and use our landscapes. But there wasn't really anything happening. So I I had that feeling that it was a sort of dream job to be a film director, yeah. you know, but it was a bit like, you know, saying you wanted to be an astronaut or whatever, you know, it's the sort of thing you'd say when you were 12, but, you know, then you'd get a proper job kind of thing. And, um, but it just stuck with me. And I was, I was academic. I was clever. Not initially, and in, like, in, it took me till I was about fifth year uh, oh, to yeah. in, in secondary school to sort of start doing quite well. I was very so you're saying there's a city. shot for me. You're saying I'm I could saying get it. I'm saying it's never too late. <laughs> you, can, I, you can still do it in fifth year. Please let me be academically gifted. <laughs> turn it around like that. Uh, turn it around, and 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 so I I went and I followed my instinct, and I was studying, and I was lucky enough to go to Trinity. But while I was there, I was still really kind of. It was niggling at me, and and my very very good friend and colleague Ed Guiney, who I'd known as a teenager just around Dublin, yeah, he was a real doer. You know, Ed was like I was a sort of more of a dreamer, and Ed was more of a well, if we want to do that, why don't we just do it? And he had the idea of setting up a filmmaking society in college, and that's how it started. That I started, you know, doing something with a camera. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it was it was you know it was a very un Hollywood. Uh, world from which I came um, uh, lucky to be middle class family but no, nobody making movies nobody acting, nobody doing anything like that it was all like kind of fantasy until it wasn't and that was, you know, and it took a long time and all that, but yeah it was, it was really around college that I started like actively doing things and making things You watched Darby O'Gill and Little People and you were like, this is it I, that is the world for me. And you can see that in my work, I hope. I know. So much, I mean, Room, I was thinking, when are the leprechauns going to show up? What's the deal with all this? I was thinking, wait, are you, what, what is this? When is it coming? And then I still enjoyed the film. It's nine out of 10. Leprechauns probably would have made it an even Would have made it, given it the full five stars. Yeah, it needed that Lenny Abrahams, you know, that send to it that you bring to your projects. But no, your first film, which I love, is Adam and Paul. And what I love about Adam and Paul, for anyone who doesn't know, it's a story about two... Dublin men, that's, that's two Dublin men who basically kind of are involved in drugs and stuff like that. But it's this really beautiful film. And what I loved about that is that it's so Irish. Like you see these characters and I, I've talked to, you know, someone who one of the guys behind the Kin show recently. And he was telling me, like, you can't really say Garda because you kind of have to make it apply to people in America and stuff like that. So when you were doing something like Adam and Paul, you know, which is just so unapologetically Irish, I can't imagine. Was there a part of you that said, well, okay, because this is my first feature, maybe we should make it, you know, maybe more Americanized. 
Yeah, I mean, I can totally, I mean, I can, I can see the impulse, right? Because, but I think as soon as you start making your stuff, I get like, Ken is a different story that's being made for an audience under a particular kind of structure and it has to work abroad. Yeah. But I was making this tiny film, which was always going to be an art house film. And, you know, we'd hoped it would be a festival film. Um, and we, we, and we thought like, maybe this is the only film we're going to make. And the we here is probably myself and Mark O'Halloran, who is the yeah. writer um, and actor. And then Johnny Spears, who was a producer. And it was like, we just have to make the film we want to make, you know, and, and I've always had that instinct really, which is only by being really kind of ruthlessly true to your impulse. That's how you eventually reach an audience. You know, if you yeah. really set out to reach an audience, if that's your measure from the beginning, you're likely to make all these kinds of decisions that you're making, you're second guessing what people are going to want or something. And then you're kind of editing you... the final version. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then, you lose what makes it distinctive if you do that. So I never was that, I was never tempted to change Mark's beautiful language, but I do remember when the film was shown in the States and actually when it was shown in Britain, it was subtitled. Yeah, so, they just automatically so, slapped subtitles on they it. They slapped, nobody had a clue what anybody was saying and they slapped subtitles on it. But But it's great for, like what was beautiful about that film for me was that when it came out in Dublin, in Ireland, but particularly in Dublin, it just had this massive uh, effect. I think it was one of the first Irish films where people went, actually recognize this as the city that I live in. Yeah. And I recognize these characters as people I know. And, and and that was just, that was so brilliant because we grew up watching, not all Irish films. I mean, Jim and Neil were making things that were really good. and But a lot of stuff was just very generic and not not, didn't feel real or good. Yeah. And, so it was lovely to make a film and then have people actually go, wow, an Irish film can be Yeah, I mean, that's totally it. That's totally it because, I mean, you, I like, I, there was no green screens, I imagine. I imagine you shot that all in, like, Dublin town. Oh, and that's what's kind sure. of so great about Because, I mean, we've seen film, like, I could give you a, probably a 48-hour montage of just the New York skylines we see in every kind of film. But Dublin, we haven't gotten that. And I was chatting with Neil Blomkamp, who directed District 9, and yes, a lot of his brilliant. films are in South Africa. Yeah. And it's like South Africa is like that gem. It's kind of untouched in the same way I feel Dublin is. And I mean, I don't know, Dublin and like when people think of Ireland, they tend to think of 40 shades of green, beautiful skylines, castles. But then Adam and Paul kind of do show that other element. And I imagine that was obviously very personal to you, especially growing up in Dublin, because, you know, as I, I'm growing up in Dublin, I can certainly see remnants of that. But I think that all kind of kind of comes together and helped build our culture in a way, whether we like it or not, these, you yeah. know, this is Ireland. Yeah, and actually, for me, it's a very positive film, ultimately, even though it's about people who are really disadvantaged and it takes place in yeah. parts of the city which are really still, actually, you know, it's not that different even 20 years later. But I think it's it's interesting what you say, because there were films being made in Dublin, independent films, but they tended to do, when they did Dublin, they tended to do a kind of... Romanticised. Yeah, romanticized are also very much like one of the iconic things we have to show. We have to show the Haveny Bridge and we have to show, and we just decided we're not going to do any of those. Like, we're not going to tick the boxes of Dublin. We're just going to try and show, like, round the back of things and, you know, like the bits that you don't normally see and, and, and actually try and get some sort of essential feeling for what the city actually feels like if you, if you walk through it. And, and, uh, and to be confident about showing Dublin rather than going, uh, oh, we better do the kind of picture postcard version because that's what that's what people will recognize. We just threw that away and it was very liberating to not shoot, you know, what everybody expects the city to look like. Yeah, there was no Adam Paul standing next to the spire saying, wow, look at our beautiful national landmark, everyone, isn't it brilliant? Yeah. <laughs> does, there, does anyone else agree that this is brilliant? Anyone? No GPO, no, you know, no no Grafton Street. Yeah, no, there was, there was... Uh, Stephen Screen, but that was like a very particular version of it. And like the alleyways and the dirt, because these are, and I know you talked about like the second you kind of visualized project, talk with the writer about you, you, you felt what the film would feel like. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's something, a lot of films just thematically, like there's Spider-Man 2 feels different from In Bruges, you know, yeah. because that different, like you couldn't do In Bruges Spider-Man, you couldn't put that Spider-Man feeling over In Bruges because it's just building that theme. And it would have been, 
Like, that's kind of the best team I feel you can do for a film like that. So was developing that visual style hard for you, especially considering that it was your first feature? Well, I was lucky because I had made shorts and I'd also made a lot of commercials, yeah. um, which isn't my bag, you know, as a filmmaker. It's not the kind of filmmaking that I'm drawn to, but it was really useful in that I had been on set a lot and I had shot a lot of stuff and played with different styles and worked with crews and equipment and all that. So that was one advantage. But as soon as I read it, Mar I read some sample scenes that Mark had written about these two characters, Adam and Paul, and I immediately sort of fell in love with the, those people. And also something in Mark's style of writing sparked off an interest or chimed with an interest that I have in like old America, American physical comedy, like Laurel mm -hmm. and Hardy and slapstick um, type of stuff. Slapstick, big time. And, and also a kind of a sort of sadness, but a kind of sadness of that, that plays with the absurdity of things and, and a childlike kind yeah. of, tone and uh, that came really quickly to me when i read those and in fact it was never clearer than on those first reads that that's an experience that i've had before which is the first encounter with something if 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 it's for me i usually get a big flash of what it will feel like how it will look how it will be paced what the drama kind of how the drama will work yeah. and then a lot of the time in the development it's just trying to hold on to that initial pure feeling and then develop it with a DP, with a camera person, with every with designer, with the actors to 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 hold that like first pure impulse, and that's where something stands or falls. Falls if you can keep that feeling, it's usually good. And if you don't dilute it, it's it it stays close to what it should be, you know. But I think I remember when I was. Um, thinking about Adam and Paul, thinking about these fixed frame shots, thinking about a certain kind of like deliberateness of, of delivery and dialogue. Yeah. Looking at those routines, those famous kind of slapstick routine routines where people are misunderstanding each other and where dialogue goes round in a circle, you know, and that seemed to fit these two oh. blokes who were, you know, addicted to drugs in this kind of cyclical repetitious life yeah. where every day is the same you wake up you try and get, you get money you try and score and you do it again the next day and so yeah. adapting that kind of innocent style of u.s slapstick to a really dark story of addiction yeah that was the flash that i think is what defines the tone of adam and paul and then it was just like hang on to that hang on to that feeling as we shoot as we prep, as we develop the script and all that, and just keep that, keep that feeling. Oh, and I, I love the fact that you brought that up. And because it was so real, I feel like it would have been easy to maybe, you know, have short changed it in some ways, just kind of change something so it would have benefited. But all these characters, they obviously do feel real. And I'm not going to spoil it for anyone, but the ending, a character comes back and checks his pockets. You'll probably know what I mean. And that's like, yeah. wow, wow. Yeah. That, that hits home. And because obviously it's that satire, like you can laugh while watching the film, but I mean, I feel if you're like if you're from Dublin, it's gonna hit home in a way. I don't know if it's America. I I I can't speak as someone who's seen it from America, but it does hit home because you know this is kind of the reality of Dublin. Like I love Dublin warts and all. You know, is Dublin a kit? Probably, but it's my kit. You know what I'm saying? Like it's yeah, our, it's, our, it's our communal kit. It's all our kit. <laughs> That's a great way to look at the world. So yeah, as a 14 year old, I'm just. I'm done. You know, we're all going to die someday. Why, why try? So thanks for that. That's what I really got from your films. Uh, but no. So while we're talking about kind of these darker directions, I, I, I want to kind of get into this. I'm not sure if you know, but there's a comic book writer here from Ireland called Garrett Dennis, who's known for his comic book work where he goes into some really dark places. And I met him. He's the loveliest guy. And it's kind of the same for you. A lot of your work goes into these darker places. Are you ever afraid as a director that maybe, oh, maybe this is too far or do you kind of just do what kind of feels right for the story? What what tends to be your process? I mean, I, I, it's funny making something just like like that old joke. How do I know what I think until I've said it? Like there is an element of um of learning about yourself from the directions that you're drawn in when you're making something. Yes. So for me, it very often does things take that take that dark turn, and I think it's because. I am moved by people in their most vulnerable states and I'm moved by people and compelled by stories which kind of look at things when they crack or don't work or fall apart. And I'm 
I've always been drawn to characters who feel themselves to be sort of on the edges of things. So yeah, that tends to be the direction that I've gone in. And I am, I mean, there are definitely darker stories in me and I have questioned about whether, like, is there any, is anybody going to watch that? You know, because it's, yeah. it, 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 it may, is it too bleak? Because you but, can't know really till the premiere, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, you kind of, you know, yes, you don't really know. And and I always laugh at people. Like I, I say, you know, that's, you know, there are a couple of films where I suppose Room is one and and maybe in a way Frank is another where for me it's a happy ending, but nobody would describe. It's probably as close as I get to a happy ending, but nobody, that's not what, you know, my daughter who is always, you know, she's 11 and she always says that, but like, it's so sad. And I think, well, no, that's, that's really optimistic as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I you know, know. <laughs> I, I totally agree with that. You know, Frank, like that was that was the first Lenny Abramson film and I love it so much. I can't wait to get into that. But yeah, that's really interesting, the fact that you bring up about, and I feel like, you know, we're all kind of products of our upbringing. I, I feel like you'd probably be a different director if you grew up in America, because if you did, we would never have gotten Adam and Paul. Garage, I'd assume, would be the same. Like a lot of your work really comes from your eyes. It is gr- grounded in Ireland, yeah, very much so. Yeah, and totally, and it would be different, like, you know, all these stories, and I feel like they would kind of lose that edge if they were set somewhere else. Like, even as an Irish director, if you film everything in, you know, Britain or America, then it's like, it's not, doesn't have that same homegrown feel. It's yeah. not, oh, so what was that first film for you that really got your name out there? Because it was Adam and Paul, then Garage, which is an amazing film kind of exploring loneliness. And then, yes. and then, so what was that first film which kind of you feel put you on the map? And yeah, make probably it was the third film. It was probably what Richard did. Like even, yeah. even Frank, even Garage went to Cannes and it got well received at Cannes, but it was still a very small art house film. And Frank is probably the one that was like, had stars in it and, yeah. you know, was already kind of, you know, it was better known outside the country. Um, but what Richard did went to Toronto and it it was sort of like very well received within the industry. And it was probably the one that like, um, I think in a way when I, I remember after Room, when I would go somewhere in the States, yeah, people would usually say, you might know him from what Richard did, Frank and Room. And I'd go, well, there were two other movies before that, you know, in Ireland. Um, and and what Richard did is an Irish film as well, but it, because it has a kind of Jack Rayner kind of got a lot of exposure from it and and, yeah. and kind of launched that launched him. And for whatever reason, it seemed to resonate more abroad than either of the first two films. So it was probably that was one. And then Frank definitely because you know it had Fassbender in it and Maggie Gyllenhaal and people like that. And and it was you know, but it's also a completely bonkers film. It's certainly not mainstream. You know. I, get, I mean, totally. And I, and it 100% has that Irish edge. Like at one point he goes, what's this? A bunch of D4 lads drinking. And it's like, yeah, that's yeah. the that's the exact type of thing people would say. I mean, you know, postal codes. I don't know if that matters anywhere else except for Dublin. So that's so real. Like, you know, D5 on top and all that. So I mean, there <laughs> <Yeah>. you go. <laughs> no, but I, and it still has that Irish edge and it's kind of unwavering in that. And, you know, I, I guess that that is very strange how that film kind of just tended to appeal, you know, to more people. But yeah, that, maybe it was because it the theme of it, which was a kind of disillusionment that can befall a person when they discover the, who they really are. You know, it's yeah. it's kind of like an anti-American uh, movie in a way, like because the American shape that you get on so many movies is that be true to yourself, you know. Yeah, and then good guy, bad great. guy. yeah. And and I, learning who you, you know, this, it's a story about like discovering who you really are. And that's usually just depicted as a very positive thing. Whereas in, in what Richard did, when Richard discovers who he really is, it's a coward and a, you know, somebody who is not driven by the finest of motives, even though that's who he thinks he is at the beginning. Um, and that seemed to resonate with people and it's about younger people. And I don't know, maybe that's why it was. Um, but you never know what's going to take you anywhere, you know, and in a way it probably wasn't really until Room where I, like that was the film that really broke out into a much bigger international kind yeah. of uh, audience that, that, and, and after that I had a certain freedom that I didn't have prior to it. Totally. And what I love about what Richard did is this is something I've seen a lot of directors and this is something I'm, I'm like, it's kind of opened up a lot to me. Like normally we see in films, there's, 
there's a good guy, there's a bad guy, and then you know there's an yeah. anti-hero. But that's such a, that anti-hero has been watered to death. It's like it yeah, doesn't mean it's a what bit of a cliche. Means. We know it. Yeah, it's like yeah. Oh, is he good or bad? No, but that's not. I feel like morally ambiguous is kind of better. Like you know, you see in these films, there's always kind of that moment, and it, this is just a you know a regular example. It's like the good guy will say, "No, I'm not going to kill the bad guy because I'm the bigger man." But that's, that's not how the world works, you know. And yeah. when you look at these characters, especially this is some I've noticed you've done. You have these main characters who a lot of them aren't good people. I mean, I was like, let me just get that out there. Like in Adam and Paul, you, 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 other, you obviously have this admiration for these characters because you've been following them for like an hour and a half. But at the same time, they don't do good things. And especially yeah. in what Richard did, that case, I mean, you can kind of look at it from both ways, but the truth is he did kill someone. And the yes. truth is he didn't do, he, he didn't do what- And he didn't to- have the guts to face up to it either. Um, yeah. Yeah, I am really interested in characters who- who are morally deeply ambiguous and flawed because all of us are, you know, in, in real life, there aren't really goodies and baddies in real life. There are, we're all somewhere in the middle and can under different circumstances behave really awfully or very nobly. And I think with what Richard did, you've got a guy who's been schooled in the idea of doing the right thing, who believes himself to be motivated by all the right things in the way that we all try to believe that about ourselves, but then discovers under deep pressure that he's not. And and actually, the film kind of falls into two halves. The first half, when he's in the state of, of you know, he's under that illusion of, of goodness. And the second half, where he has to face up to who he really is. Yeah. And it's funny, because I've noticed that a lot of my films fall into those into that shape. Um, like, uh, Garage has a kind of before and after shape. And Room certainly has a yeah. two-half oh, shape. Oh, totally. You know, and I've always... So rather than the three-act structure, I tend to... I, I, I tend to be drawn to the not quite two acts, but two phases where you look at characters in very different circumstances and see what that how that helps you understand, you know, get a more three dimensional view of who they are. Yeah, that's interesting. I watched a few of your interviews and you brought up that idea of kind of having the climax of the film halfway through yeah. and then dealing with what comes after. And I literally wrote it down. I was like, I want to bring that up because that's so interesting. And like, for example, Room, there was a point halfway through where I feel like a lot of other directors would have just ended the film because yeah. that's like, that's that's kind of what I was considered the story. But then you have this boy who now gets to experience the world and it was just, it, it's such an amazing idea. And so what is it about, you know, having that climax halfway through? Is it just something unique or is it something that you just feel suits the story best? I, I think it's something that I'm I'm often drawn to because like if you're analysing something, it, it's really that kind of that's a really stark structure that allows you to take a really big kind of look at character you know so in room it's also following on obviously from Emma Dunhue's book um it room was the first kind of proper adaptation that I was involved with what Richard did did start with the book but it went in a it went in a very very different direction to the book that it was based on yeah. um but even in room uh probably the second phase of the story was one that we intent we we added to in the film so we probably you know more so even than the book have this um quite kind of substantial second phase um where we kind of i think the escape happens pretty much bang in the middle of the story in the movie yeah. um and I, I also i'm always drawn to challenges you know to kind of like to uh, challenges to the craft and and it was such an interesting challenge to take a story like the one in Room where the big, big problem that the characters have is getting out of this place. And we let them get out of that place halfway through the movie and you go, well, how are you going to sustain the interest yeah. of the audience? And, you know, do that was a real tightrope walk in the middle, trying to, on the one hand, bring them out, but on the other hand, not let all the air out of the tire so yeah, that you still sure... had a feeling of tension. I'm sure it might have been easier for you as a director to just say, okay, well, the room, like they're out of the room, that's kind of the end of the story. But instead, you took it in that direction, which I find really fascinating. So, with the room, which I'm sure everyone has heard of, it's just, I mean, I, I remember I caught this. Actually, this might have been one of the first films of yours I've seen before, Frank, because it was playing on TV and it was terrifying. Yes. It's a horror film. It's, I yeah, mean, in a way, it is. Yeah. And so, did you shoot that in like an actual room? Like in a, no, so what we did, build it or. We- we built it, but initially we thought, well, you know, it's described in the novel as being like 10 by 10 feet 
room. So for anybody who doesn't know, the story is about a mother and son who live inside this very small space. Basically, they're in a kind of prison, effectively, that she's been kidnapped some many years before the story starts by a guy and kept prisoner, effectively, in a shed in the garden. And she becomes pregnant by him and has a child. And the story uh, in the novel takes place from the child's point of view, starts on his fifth birthday. And all he's ever known is this room. Um, and his mother, in order to stop him from feeling like he's missing out on everything and to sort of protect him from the horror of the situation, has told him that this is the whole world. You know, this is the, you know, this is the world and he's not, there's no outside. Um, and we watch as that illusion has to be sort of broken. Uh, but we thought to ourselves as we were preparing to shoot, like, there's no way you're going to succeed in, you couldn't sustain an hour's worth of cinema in a space that small. Um, so we we did these experiments where we played with slightly bigger spaces. And as as we worked, we realized, no, we really have to shrink it because, because the challenge of the film needs to be the same as the novel, which is, is it possible to have a childhood in this space? And... And in the end, we settled for, I think it was like 10 by a tiny bit longer than it was wide, but it was like uh, the same effectively size as the as the room in the novel. We built it, but we never broke that rule. The camera lens is always within that space. Yeah. We never cheated. Nice. So you must have been like that, just with the camera like that, just holding it. <laughs> it was really hard. It was really the hardest thing. And quite often there's a bath in the room and I was in the bath. Because it was the only place that I could be where I wasn't seen, but I could still pop up and work with Jake, the little boy who plays the the character Jack in the so story. directing so, yeah. isn't all glamour. You're saying uh, I, it is none of it is glamour, <laughs> is what I'm saying. <laughs> I thought it was all two billion, you know, two billion euro houses. No, this is you have no, to no, do work. The, you have to do actual work, and uh, and a lot of the time it's very tiring. And kind of, listen, I'm not complaining. It's a brilliant way to to work it's a brilliant life you know i'm very privileged but yeah it's 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 not all <laughs> um it's not all paparazzi that's for sure did you shoot re room was obviously that was shot in america right it actually shot in canada set in america oh yeah what what differences do you find shooting in on I, I i wonder what people in dublin especially are like when they say you're when you're shooting a film do they tend to be receptive or they Shooting, I've done a lot of work on the streets in Dublin with no, you know, with very little money and security. So Adam and Paul being a classic example. And I also did this series called Prosperity. Um, they're very, they're like exactly as you'd expect them to be, like very funny, very teasing, <laughs> excellently disrespectful. <laughs> um, you know, they manage, don't they? They they, <laughs> they do manage, and they all and really and really nosy about what you're doing. So yeah, we had. I, I've had a lot of that, but actually, can I be in the film, bro? Can I be in it, bro? That's pretty not... much it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Like, uh, what are you doing? You work for RTE. Um, can I be Just in tell it? Them. Here? Just say RTE. Yeah, yeah RTE exclusive. Yeah, that always that's brilliant because when you tell them that you're working for RTE, they're not interested anymore and they leave you alone. So it's great. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's the number one tip for Irish filmmakers coming from <laughs> Lenny. Now, uh, no, but another one of your films I'd love to touch on, and this is the one probably. You know, this is the film like that I kind of really responded to first time I watched it. And of course, your other works as well, but Frank in particular. Yeah. I mean, I really enjoy Frank. And I know you've talked about this in a couple of video interviews, and this is really interesting. You coming on, did you say no to Frank the first time you were offered it? Yeah, I did. And Frank was the only film that I've made that came from the outside like that. In other words, where somebody sent me a script and said, um, are you interested in doing this? And I, yeah. it was... and. Um, I said no initially because I remember thinking it's impossible to make a film about yeah. somebody where, where the lead actor is inside a fake plastic head, you know, where where you don't see the face of the actor. And it's such an absurd premise and it's so bonkers as an idea, but it it wouldn't leave me alone after I read it. And after I'd said no, my agent, uh, Rachel, said, and actually a wonderful woman called Tessa Ross, who used to run film four said you should read it again don't don't have one more think about it and i did and i thought okay and it was you know what it was that kept me in the set in the middle of 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 the second section of the story in frank involves this kind of crazy band going to a kind of cabin in the woods effectively and writing an album yeah and that whole section had something of that same slapstick 
absurd. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. You know, and, and I remember thinking, God, there's, and it's also, I talked about challenges earlier that I'm always drawn to films where there's a big challenge, you know, creatively to make it work. And I think trying to, I couldn't let go of that idea of trying to make a film work where there were as many obstacles as there are in Frank. And so I engaged then with the producers and with uh, this, the writers, these wonderful writers, Peter Strawn and Mark Ron uh, John Ronson. And we started this conversation and then it, I got much more excited about it. And we got stuck in and we spent about a year working on the script. And I spent a lot of time with the writers. We went away. We we sort of put ourselves in a, in a little house in the middle of nowhere for a while and hammered out ideas about how to make, you know, what, what to do with the film. And, and the, yeah, and then I was really all in. But initially I thought, forget it, this is not possible. Yeah, on paper, it does seem like an idea that shouldn't work. But yeah, yeah. you watch the film and it's just so, and it's something, and like that's, I don't want to spoil it, but you did talk about that kind of having a happy ending, which some people may not look at that way. But I certainly feel like that's very optimistic and it's very, it's a great way to end it because, you know, it doesn't have like a cliche, everyone's friends again, everything's happy kind of again, yeah. but it still has that inherent optimism, which I believe helps. Yeah, make it and, and actually what it shows is the character of Donald Gleeson, who yeah, I love. Yeah, he grows, he grows, grows he a lot. He grows, he realises that he's been living in this total fantasy. So it's another character coming to terms of what they're not able to do or what they're not capable of, you know, and John learns that his fantasy about being an amazing rock star and musician and songwriter is never going to happen. And for me, that's quite optimistic. You know, because yeah. it shows you that a person can learn something about themselves. Um, yeah. you know, even if it's not maybe what they had hoped at the beginning. Yeah, and that last song, you know, I love you. I should, that's on my playlist. I genuinely I that's think, that's Stephen Rennick said his absolute best. Another another Dubliner. Yeah, who you I mean everything. I, know, I saw you mentioned in interview that the music by Stephen Rennick, he was an amazing. I mean, he's so good at it, but like that was really hard for Frank because the actors were performing it live, right? Yeah, that we, we, so it's a band and we didn't want it to be that thing where you see, you know, and on movies about bands where they're all pretending to play and you don't believe it for a moment. So we cast actors who could play or had some musicality, but then the songs of the band had to be written to fit those actors, um, like what they were able to play. And so there was this constant conversation between the music and the casting. And yeah. keeping changing as we cast people. Okay, what can this person play? What are they capable of? And then you're writing music for a band where the band can't become famous because they're too out there. Um, they're sort of crap, but not really. That's such a hard brief, you yeah, know. It, yeah. But I think he did an amazing job. You know, they. I mean, the most likable song ever. It's really likable. You know, you just can't hate it. I don't. I don't know what. I don't know what you guys did there. It's amazing, but no. I mean, I really love Frank, and I think it's just a testament to that. And the fact that there was almost an element of, you know what, this is impossible. That's why I'm going to do it. You know, you just yeah. came on. There was that, you know, just that broad face, the, the, the determination. Um, but, yeah, you know, it, it, it's fun to try something when you know it's going to be hard. That's for because sure. Because Frank was like, you know, Frank Sidebottom was a real person. I mean, obviously, the yeah. events are very kind of, you know, I can't imagine those events exactly happen. But because he was real, obviously, there kind of had to be an element of respect that you brought to the project. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's like a fantasy version of, of a character that's already a fantasy because the real Frank Sidebottom for older um, viewers might remember that he was on kids TV in Britain in the 1980s. And and um, and John Ronson, one of the writers, was in his band. And then John and Peter uh, were screenwriters of a film called The Men Who Stare at Goats with George Clooney. I don't know if you remember that movie. Yeah. And while they were working on that, they were telling stories about John's time in the Frank Sidebottom, oh, blimey, big band. And they came up with this insane idea. Well, what if there was a person who really, really lived all their life as a kind of character in a fake, you know, hiding behind a mask, which is what this yeah. character of Frank Sidebottom did. But in his real life, Chris Seavey, who was the guy behind Frank Sidebottom, did, you know, he didn't always go around in a fake head. So the fantasy of the movie is what if there was somebody who lived like that all the time? So it's a kind of, it's a kind of the real Frank Sidebottom was the jumping off point for the movie. And yeah. so it's, 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 it's all sorts of complicated in terms of its conception and, uh, and, and how you might realize it. And yeah, so it was a, it was a mad 
period in my life, which I'll never forget and which I love doing, but it was very hard. Yeah, and the match came off at the end in a really beautiful yeah. way, uh, which was amazing. One I of the, your last projects I'd love to touch on was The Little Stranger. Is this your yes. most recent feature? Yeah. Yeah, it would be. And so that was an adaptation as well. You know, well, surely by this point, you've kind of mastered adaptations in a way. You kind yeah. of know how to do them as opposed to maybe when you started out. Yeah, and I, I, I'm going to, try, I've, you know, and then I went on and did two more. I did, you know, Normal People and, and Conversations with Friends. But, and I'd never intended to stay doing adaptations. It's just that I, I sort of became kind of known for them. And then I got these opportunities to do these amazing projects based on on books. But The Little Stranger, I had, before I even made what Richard did, after re making Garage, I read this book called The Little Stranger. And I tried to get the rights to make it then. All the way and back I failed. then. failed. All the way back then. I failed because I had I was basically somebody who'd made almost nothing except for two very small movies. And um and I nearly made it. I met Sarah Waters and everything, but didn't get it in the end. And then years later, after fra around the time of Frank coming out, yeah, my reputation was sort of building. I uh I re-engaged with the people who then had the rights to the little strange and you were like please let me do it please 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 <laughs> and, and i was like i'm still interested in that and they said well we'd love to talk to you about it this was the people who then had the rights and then room came out which gave me a lot more clout and so i was able finally to make the little stranger and it's a project i'm really proud of which although it didn't reach as big an audience as i would love it to have reached and i think part of that reason was it was released as a straight horror, which I think was a yeah. big mistake because it's absolutely not that. It's not. Uh, yeah, I, I don't feel like that. Obviously, I mean, you know, studio C Supernatural are like, bang, must be horror. Yeah, let's you go. Know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but I, I really think it's one of your strongest films. I really enjoyed that. And yeah, I mean, adaptations, like, especially I feel like are they're like, they're a different gravy altogether because, you know, you don't get to just, you can't change everything. You can't just start from scratch. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting process and, and it's trying to make something work from shifted from one medium into another involves a whole load of kind of reconfiguration and recalculation. And, and, and I, yeah, uh, like, I think I sort of, I don't think I've mastered it because I don't think you ever master anything. It's always a new challenge. Every time you read a book, if you want to make it into a film, but I feel like at the moment I'm keen to kind of take a little step back towards um, making things just that just come out of, your head and don't start as anything else having done two more adaptations obviously oh yeah totally and so yeah th that that's one of the last things i'd love to touch on uh tv what is it about tv that you kind of wanted to jump into or what is it about tv that you kind of felt like you would be good at well i think back in the day when i was sort of starting out there was really two very separate worlds it was the world of film and the world of television and definitely filmmakers felt themselves a little bit sort of elevated from television makers. You know, it was like, oh, no, I make movies. I don't make television. And there was some truth to that because television tended to be for a bigger audience and to be broader, a bit more formulaic and maybe yeah. more of a writer's medium than a director's medium. That was the yeah. that was the wisdom. People would say, yeah, film's the director's medium, TV's the writer's medium. And then you have the... Uh, advent of hbo and eventually all the streaming services and suddenly there's this golden age of television where some of the best stuff that you see was on the small screen right some of the most interesting most kind of kind of unconventional freest stuff was happening on television uh the wire is a really good example of something that oh was, yeah you know you couldn't have made it for a movie it was far too oddly far too detailed and novelistic and complex and you couldn't have distilled that down into an hour and a half two hours um, and so i think a lot of directors at that point were thinking god there's something really interesting happening in television and i was certainly of that mind and then when um, sally rooney's book came to me uh by ed guiney normal people i just love the book and it was just right in my kind of for me it was in a very sweet place like it was irish it was very contemporary it was about young irish people who were living in a culture that was had transformed itself from the Irish culture that I grew up in, you know, where the Catholic church weren't dominant anymore, where young people were more open about their sexuality, about their kind of, you know, their view of the world. And yeah. I was very drawn to the idea of bringing this picture of a different sort of Ireland out into the world. And I loved Sally's writing and I felt like this is very exciting. You know, 
And you take something like normal people, which is a very forensic like study. But you couldn't have done it in an hour and 30. You could not have done it in an hour and 30. And if you had managed, let's say you'd made a longer film and you found a way of distilling it. I guarantee you that the film would have played in a few art house cinemas. It would not have reached anything like even a tiny percentage of the audience it reached if it had been made for cinema because the cinema space, and you'll know this, is so hard at the moment. It's so dominated by yeah. um, big tentpole movies. It's so dominated by Marvel and by the, the a few studios and by superhero films. And it's really targeted at a young, young, young audience. Yeah. Um, and yet something like Normal People, which is like decidedly undramatic in a way, like nothing, nothing blows up, nothing huge happens. It's like very kind of, it's at the level of very small details that the story unfolds. Yeah. Yet the challenge there was, is that possible to get that to an audience? Is is there an audience for it? And I think what we showed with... You found out that there very much is an audience. We certainly did. And it was just so um, heartening and and kind of, I think we it made us all a lot more optimistic about the appetite that there is out there for quieter stories, you know? Yeah. Um, but it was about television. It suited it. It was episodic. As a story, it suited the medium, and maybe maybe something to do with lockdown and the fact that everybody was kind of yeah. tied to their to their houses and their flats and their, you know, the the people were that it just was the perfect time to 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 put it out there. Yeah, and I love what you brought there about films. Like, I mean, as much as I love superhero films, I, there's a point there where it's like they there's a bit of repetitiveness, and like I, you know, that's not me slighting any filmmakers. Like, I love yeah, sure, no, it's so some of it is amazing, and there's a you know, it's there very is that formulaic, well. and I, like you can't, you, they, there's nothing. I'm not like saying that's inherently wrong, but there is a formula. Like, and in fairness, it works. The formula works. Like it's getting people in seats. But you know, when films like The Northman and Everything Everywhere All at Once are coming out, I hope that that same thing is attested there. So then, you know, they, they're the chances that filmmakers need are given. You know, yes, I actually think that like it's always a pendulum, and yeah, at a certain point, it swung away, like cinema like the, th- the theatres themselves swung away from independent one-off um, pieces of storytelling. But I think that's going to come back again. Yeah. It absolutely will. I mean, I'm, I I have to believe it will. And I, I agree with you about, like, everywhere, uh, everything everywhere all the time is a really good example. That's A24, who I've worked with, who were the the studio. Oh. The room was, a- room was oh, A24's room. Yeah. first Oscar nomination. And... Um, uh, so it was lovely to be there when they were not quite as huge a company as they are now. I still think they're absolutely brilliant. They're like, you know, they're what's keeping independent cinema going in the, you know, in the States particularly, but globally. Um, so, uh, yeah, I do think it's going to come back. I've got a, it's something I'm working on at the moment. I'm writing something which I would love to be in the cinema, you know, yeah. and it's, it's, a, it's a different, you know, it's not loud. It's not fast. But I still think it could have a life. Uh, yeah, the, I love. I mean, watching films on just the biggest screen and just that fit. It's one of the. Uh, it's there's, the best. there's nothing like it. Like at the same time, you can watch it on your phone, but it's like it, you know, it's different yeah. when you have it and you're sitting in that seat. It just it makes me happy talking about it. Uh, but no, our time comes near. So just my last couple of filmmaker centric questions. Yeah, sure. What is your dream project? If I said to you, Actually, any job with any any adaptation, any of your own stuff. Any yeah. IP, what is your dream job as a director? Okay, so my dream job at the mo- is the thing that I'm working on at the moment, probably because it's a film about my own growing up in Dublin. Yeah. Um, it's a, In fact, it's an idea which spans over more than one film. I want to track a particular family through uh, three phases, you know, from the late, from the late 50s, which before yeah. I was born, through the late 70s when I was uh, coming into my teens, into the 2000s when I was grown up and the and the family is, the parents are nice. older. And yeah, it all takes of, place in Dublin. Nice, so kind of a Kenneth Branagh type of Belfast type of thing, like talking about in that same way, or would you describe Probably it Probably a less sentimental than Belfast, really a bit, a little bit harsher, but but it, I yeah. suppose it, in the same sense that it is family, focused on a family and what it is to be a family. And that project, I... You know, it's very close to my heart and I would love, love to make that. That's probably at the moment my dream project. Yeah. I'd kill to see that, especially having a set in Dublin. That would be amazing. Like 
you know, seeing a film set, like, see, like obviously you've done that before, but getting to see something like that, which deals with people from Dublin, like you, the fact that you put that in your films, it's really amazing for people like me and so much other people. To Brilliant. See. So Hopefully that, that's, we'll have a chance to see it. Oh man, that would be amazing. And so uh, my, my last question, what advice would you have for anyone looking to become a filmmaker? You know, is it just, you know, get nominated for an Oscar? Is that basically just the... Yeah, that's the that's the game plan. The quick no. and sure. Tell that's everyone you're working for way. the RTE. Just say RTE. That's it. You love. Just say RTE. My advice would be, I mean, take advantage of how, of the moment that we're in. When I was starting out, you didn't have the opportunity to make something cheaply. You know, it was always like you had to get a, you had to get film and you had to get a, a film camera. And now you have in your pocket an amazing tool with your phone. And so my advice to anybody, especially young person who wants to get into film, is just start doing it and, and work towards making things with friends or, you know, with people that, you know, get connected to people at the same stage that you're at and start making things. There's no other way to make films other than to make films, I think. No other way to learn to make films than to make them. I, I, I think film school is definitely an option. I didn't go as it happens, but I think... If it suits you, it's a brilliant thing to do. But either way, there is nothing stopping you from experimenting with storytelling on screen, given the technology that exists now. Yeah, absolutely. Lenny, it has been a true and genuine on channel with you. So before I let you go, are you on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, anything like that? I'm on Twitter at Lenny Abrahamson. That's my only social media outlet, but I do check it and I do occasionally respond. And I'm going to ask you a question now that before you go, what's your, like, obviously you're doing this, amazing thing at only 14 yeah what's your aim is it to stay in the world of commentating about film and yeah. uh, reading and writing about it or is it something that you want to do filmmaking yourself? filmmaking is totally something i'd love to do it's such Excellent. a great world and you know the fact no like it's really inspiring to see someone like you who is from dublin who has these irish stories that are very unwavering it, it like you know, you're so like, I mean, I've, and Ireland just has a wealth of fantastic filmmakers. Like I got to shout with Paddy Slarty, who's an upcoming director who did Broken Law. And you look at, oh some, yes, like, and all these just amazing directors. So the fact that a director like you uh, would gen would take the time to chat me is such an honor. Well, listen, if you ever want any advice, get in touch. I'd be glad yeah? to help. Oh, yeah. thank you. So that means the world coming for you. I'll talk to you a little bit off air. Uh, but anything you can promote a uh, conversation with friends oh, and every there's nothing out at the moment i mean there's lots of stuff that you can watch on you know you can see the back catalog on most of, most of the films are available and i think you can still watch conversation with friends and normal people on the player uh if you're if you're interested so yeah it's all there if you want it yeah and that, that's all you can just say it's under rte so no one will annoy you that's your new no one will annoy you that's your new method that's for shooting in the streets of Dublin. Oh, it's just an RTE interview. Oh, they'll ah. never forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> Lenny, thank you so much for everyone. Uh, be, you can go all follow me over on Twitter at SamboGizmo1. Please make sure to like and subscribe. And as always, if you have the means, please make sure to donate to the National Deaf Student Society. Link for that first description. My friend Declan Shelby, Irish comic book writer and artist. New comic, Old Dog, comes out September 28. You can all pre-order that from your local comic book store. Uh, but this has been my chat, one of my favourite directors. Genuinely one of my heroes. Lenny, thank you so much, sir. Have a brilliant day. And you, Daniel. Thank